question. Um, we're going to share with you today, in something that was the text or an idea of Carl Jung, and Carl Jung was an eminent psychoanalyst who worked with Sigmund Freud and answered a lot of questions. Unfortunately, so many people still are reluctant to hear the answers. I, 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 I find it amazing that here you have a group of people come down in this lovely room, uh, probably the most conservative church in this town, probably one of the most conservative churches in, in the state. I've never seen anybody fall over a chair or writhe on the floor or, or go berserk or anything in this place. Um, and, 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 and the idea, of we've always come together and we've searched in realms of trying to find the origin, trying to find a harmony with nature, uh, trying to find a way to send out love so that there would be a change in the violent attitudes of people, trying to find a place for animals so that they would be treated with dignity and respect, to uplift the, the status of women, and, 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 and all of these beautiful, lovely things to bring a harmony of nature, and we're considered a cult. We're considered a cult and considered something evil. I mean, had I forgot to tell you that the fellow upstairs, uh, I went to order blinds, you know, for that room. And the fellow upstairs who has the uh, paint store said, a lady come in, this, was this shopping for paint. She says, how's it feel to have that uh, cult downstairs? And he says, you mean the church? She says, well, that's no church, that's a cult. Uh, and I said, well, of course, you know, obviously she's never, never been here. But that basically is part and parcel of the reason of so much evil because religion and the system is based on a, 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 a speaker who says this is the way it is and everybody then who sits in the chairs believes it and follows it. They don't, they don't explore, they don't come and say let me see, you know, let me find out, let me ask. They just, somebody said it, it must be true and so then you're bad, you're evil, you know. Um, I, I, I was talking to some people last night and, and I said well gee you know, we are different, and we've moved out of the mainstream, but I've looked at the mainstream, and I've seen the violence of it. I've seen the hurt of it. I've seen all of the terrible things that have happened throughout my lifetime and throughout lifetimes that it's never, it's always been the same. Trying and trying and trying to find something that doesn't exist, and in the meantime, accumulating all of the violence and letting it spill out in one another, and, and taking a creation which obviously was intended to be the heaven of the cosmos and turning it into a literal hell. And then saying, this is the way it is, you know. So we look because there's something terribly, terribly wrong, you know. Something very, very wrong in, in all of our institutions, no matter what they be, that's built on competition and violence. And you would think, well, you could understand that in the in the business community competition. Sometimes it gets violent when people cheat and so forth and so on. And you can understand it even in the government business because there's competition between nations. You know, who, who's going to build the bigger whatever and who's going to have a better society. And so they compete with one another. But you would think then religion would come along and interject into this a, a harmony and a flow. And yet we find out that the most competitive industry probably in the world is religion extremely competitive and extremely violent, you know. Never ever, and never ever stops to even listen to the other person. If you don't say something that's in agreement with their philosophy, you're instantly considered some type of a satanic heretic or whatever, you know. And so there we find that how long you're going to live, I have no idea. How long I'm going to live, I have no idea. But there's one thing for sure. Unless nature itself changes things from the inside, you will continue to live not only within your home where there's chaos, within your neighborhood where there's chaos, but within the very structure of your society where there's a continuing chaotic movement of competition, fighting, separation, degrading of people. It never ends. It never has ended. You know. And yet, what is the, what is the solution as far as the, the religions of the world are concerned? Wait till you die. After you die, you'll go to another planet and everything will be all right. <laughs> Basically, that's it. You've got to wait till you die and then you're going to go to another planet. And, and even though you're mature people, you realize that's absolute nonsense. We go along with it because nobody's ever thought of, well, what else am I going to do? Right. So let's take a look at something to see maybe is there a way to correct the course. And, the people like Carl Jung and some of the other people of, of, of years ago said, yes, there is. You don't have to live like this. It doesn't have to be a cutthroat type of, 
of, of existence for people. Let's, let's take a look, first of all, and look at the creation. And go back to the very first page of the Bible. Open up to the very first page, page one. It had probably have a lot of, very little trouble finding page one. It, it, it is, it's usually safe that you'll wind up there. But let me show you something, and we'll look at the creation. And this is basically, you want to call it God, you can call it God. That's almost got an improper connotation nowadays. You want to call it nature, the force, whatever you want to call it, I don't care. But in Genesis 1.10, on the very first page, it says, God called the dry land earth, the gathering together the waters, called he the seas. God saw that it was good. Good. Creation says, this is good. Nature says, this is really good. You know, we got all these planets circling around, but this is the only one. You say, this is really good. Look at 112. The earth brought forth grass, herb yielding seed, and the tree yielding fruit. Seed was in itself, and God saw that it was good. This is really good. He's getting, getting excited about it. This is really nice, you know. I can, you can see the architect. You can see the painter of the picture saying, this is beautiful. This is really beautiful. Look at 118. Okay, Genesis 1.18. Rule over the day and the rule over the night to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw it was good. This is the way it should be, you know. God, whatever it is, looking around saying, why didn't we think of this before? Look at this, this is really good. This is really neat, you know. Look at 121. Great whales and every living creature moves and the waters brought forth abundantly and every winged fowl. And God saw that it was good. 125. Made the beasts of the earth and the cattle and everything that creeps upon the earth, and God saw that it was good, very good. In 127, God created man in his own image. And in 131, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. That's nature. Look, everything is considered. The atmosphere, the beautiful feminine Mother Earth, the things that grow out of the Earth, the beautiful aspects of, of, the, of the fowl that fly through the air and the creatures of the sea and, and the beasts that roam the field. Everything is good. This is, wow. It's like an artist just looking back and surveying, you know. An architect who has built a... So beautiful, so good. And everything is there. And I've put human beings in to, into this to enjoy this magnificent thing. But according to the religious teachers, it isn't any good. That's all I've ever been told. This world is no good. It's no good. So we've got to get out of here. We've got to die and go to some other place. And, and the other place they may be sending you, maybe God made it and he looked back and he said, this is a fakakta. I don't like this. I'm going to go down to earth. The one place that nature and God said is good is the place that Christians want to get you out of. Don't stay there. It's no good. It's an evil place. Don't be, a, don't be of the world. The world is no good. There's something wrong with the world. They ne Have you ever gone to the church? Do you ever go into the church and they talk about how beautiful it is, how wonderful it is? Do they ever talk about the animals? Do they ever talk about the, the giant whales or the dolphins? Do they ever talk about the pussy cats? Do they ever talk about anything? All they talk about is a book and your guilt, and your sin, and the God who's going to bring fire, and all the crucifixions, and blood, and guts, and demons, and devils, and all of this crap, they never turn around and they say, wow, this is good. This is good. The trees are good, and the animals are good. Everything is good. And they said, no, we got we to gotta, we gotta die and get out of here, because this world is no good. So there's basically the first problem. Those who are the students completely disagree with the teacher. Those who are the patients completely disagree with the doctor. It's no good. Our entire religious understanding is that you've got to physically die and leave the place that God said is good and go someplace else. Where? It's going to die. First of all, that's the first premise. Isn't this great? Isn't this something great? You were given life, and the moment that you're given life, the first thing that you're told is that you've got to die. Doesn't work out any good until you die. So hurry up and get on with it. But there's something funny about that. 
There's something funny about that, because instinct tells the goose to fly to Acapulco. Instinct tells the robin to fly to your backyard. Instinct tells the dog how to give puppies. Instinct tells all of the creatures all over the universe how to do different things. And instinct propels them all in the right direction so they know what to do. They do what they should do. And instinct says everything is wonderful. And instinct tells you don't die. Instinct tells you live. You will do anything to protect yourself. If I raise my fist, the first thing you'll do is raise, because you will protect yourself. Instinct will come and say, I'm not going to get hurt. I am going to live. See? But yet they tell you that the thing that nature wants you to do is die so you can go to heaven. But nature itself says, no, I want you to live. Stay alive. Because if heaven was a place that you went to after you died, then your natural instinct would be to die. But your natural instinct is to live. And the reason your natural instinct is to live is summed up, I think, in the words of Jesus Christ, which you can find on page 799 if you look with me. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, page 799. In verse 32, Jesus Christ said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Nature has never constructed any human being to die. You're made to understand life and to live. And your natural instinct is to preserve your life at all costs. It doesn't make any difference how well you know or believe that Jesus or God is waiting to receive you in heaven, how well you believe that St. Peter is ready to enter you into the Golden Gate, no matter what happens, the one thing that you will do at all costs is protect your life. Right? You could go into any church and they're all teaching, I can't, they'll sing their gospel songs, I can't wait to get out of this whole rotten world and go up to see Jesus. I want to be with Jesus and Jesus is my Lord. I want to be with Jesus and Jesus is my Lord. Okay, you want to be with Jesus? Here's a gun, you're going to die. Ah! No, no, no. Ah, don't kill me. Ah! Will you be with Jesus? Ah! I'm just saying with the dog. What happened? Well, nobody, that's not true. It's a lie. It is a lie. There is nobody in any church in this Sunday morning that wants to drop dead so they can be with Jesus. <laughs> nobody. All right, everybody, let's drop dead time. We're going to be with Jesus. I got a machine gun, so you'll all be going up to glory today. Hallelujah, praise his holy name. No! Is that stupid? The whole thing is stupid. But do you know what? We all bought it. We all bought it hook, line, and stinker, and we said, this is, this is, this is it. I want to die. I can't wait to die so I can go to be with the Lord. Then you ever hear just what they say? Some poor wretch dies in his bed. He's going to be with the Lord. <laughs> he died. He didn't want to die. He got hit by a garbage truck. It wasn't a good idea. <laughs> right? He got hit by some people get they, they go right in the garbage truck. They fall in garbage trucks and everything. What? Did he want to be with the Lord? But that's what else are they going to say? This guy's getting thirteen thousand dollars to put this guy in a box, put him in a hole, and tell you, yeah, here's a card. He went to be with the Lord. <laughs> got hit by a truck. So Jesus says God is a God of the living. So yeah, as far as going to be with the Lord, what does it say in the Bible? It says in John, look at it. Go to John 14. Somebody tell me what page John 14 is on. You want to go to be with the Lord, all right? Poor Gerard died, and he went to be with the Lord. Page 880, okay? Look at John 14, page 880. Look at verse 20. You want to go to be with the Lord? Next time you go to one of those funerals and they start saying, stand up right in the middle of the funeral parlor and say, just a minute, just a minute. Bill said. Right there. Right. It says, what does it say, John 14, 20? At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, you in me, and I in you. You want to be with the Lord? Go inside of yourself. Because he doesn't live on a planet anywhere. Unless he was making monkey faces up there. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> could, you, could you imagine this? The Lord will see you now. <laughs> <laughs> when I finish with this banana. What do we got? Wouldn't that be something? What would you do? My God. Anyhow, 
So here then we learn that to be with the Lord is to be within ourselves. As Jesus Christ says in Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is within you. This is, it just, you know, it just makes so much sense. So it's such a beautiful, beautiful aspect. The Christian world, say, is not simply the church, however. It's the theology of the community. It's, 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 it's the world where that theology dominates. And that theology has always been a principle of violence and evil. It's, it, you know what you need to do? You need to go to a, to a library, and you need to sit and spend a couple of hours and get out books on the history of religion. It is violent, and it is bloodthirsty, it is horrible. And, it, and, you know, they talk about people playing with Ouija boards. Give me a break. It wasn't too long ago in, in Massachusetts that they were burning people on the stake who do thought differently. They'd burn them alive. These religious people, and they'd be with their prayer books saying prayers. Praise God, praise Jesus. Hey, hey give me a lighter, loan me, your, loan me your lighter. Off they go. It wasn't that long ago, folks, in Europe, when they came knocking on the door. The, the cardinals in their frocks, you know, their Christians said, hey, you know, I got a knife here, and you know, they called it the Inquisition. They'd slit your throat if you didn't confess Jesus as Lord. Then they mounted up tremendous armies. They called it the Crusades. Don't take it. It was born in violence and fear, and you didn't dare disagree because they'd kill you. They would kill you. For, in an instant, they would kill you if you disagreed. I mean, you people, I'll tell you right now, if the conditions existed now, that existed then, you wouldn't be there sitting in here. No way. Because your instinct would be to live. <laughs> and the church didn't tolerate people that dissented, they killed them. And if you kill them off of them, what you do is you create what they created in Russia, or you create in any communist country, what they created in, you think people like living like they do in, in Cuba? What can they do about it? Nothing. They've got to shut up, because if they say anything, they'll kill them. That's exactly the way the church worked. A communistic philosophy that was funded by a capitalistic motif. Stick their hand in your pocket and you shut up. All they want from you, give your money and don't give your opinions. And that's the way Christianity is to this day. And, and what can you do about it? What can anybody do about it? They don't dare do anything about it. Except pump into the heads of kids all of this filth and violence and scary stuff about demons and devils and all of this stuff. And what's the excuse? The whole excuse for the evil is to say, there's nothing we can do, we have to wait until we die and go someplace else. Because this old world is no good. You know why? You know why? Because they cannot solve the evil. And why can't they solve the evil? Because they're creators of it. The guy that sets the trap isn't going to tell you what the trap is. The Buddha said that a long time ago. Be careful. Make sure you dwell in nirvana. Follow your spiritual instinct. Don't follow your animal instinct. Because what an animal does is very predictable. Anybody that's a skilled hunter can go out and track down any animal because he knows that animal follows a set pattern and instinct, and he knows what that animal's going to do. And when the church or whatever, they know exactly what you're going to do. And they'll say the things to turn you on, and they know what to do to turn you off, and they'll set a trap for you, and you'll step right into it every time. They'll know how you're going to react. Billy. Get up a minute so people can see. When we were in New York last night, a lady came up to me afterwards, and I would guess that she was just like our age or a couple of years older, and she said she had been talking to you about the church and the influence, et cetera. And she grew up Catholic, and she said she went to Catholic school her first 12 years, and she wanted to go to a secular college. And the priest told her mother that she should not be allowed to go to the secular college. If she wasn't going to go, excuse me, Catholic college, she just should not go. Uh, because the knowledge that she would receive could uh, influence her in, an, in a bad way. So this gr woman did not go to school until later on when she could put herself through school. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's one of the things, too, that religion can't deal with is intellectuals. They can't deal with people who can think for themselves. That's very frightening. You know, the, we're not going to go back to the history of Galileo again, but he was just one. There was another the lady came to me last night in New York, told me about some other Italian person that was a scientist who underwent a lot worse than Galileo. In fact, was burned at the stake just by giving a scientific uh, treatise of a particular scientific fact. You know, what they did in the beginning of the church in killing people, today they still do it, only they call it ethnic cleansing. It's the same thing. You're seeing it over in Bosnia right now, 
where the Christian Serbs are cleansing the Muslims out of their midst by killing them. It happens. Adolf Hitler was the master of it. And, and you know, it, it, the problems we're, we're doing what, what, what Adam and Eve did. We're, we're dipping into the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and basically, we don't deal from the tree of life because we've been warned to stay away from the tree of life. Don't you understand? The tree of life is the divine consciousness within you. It is within you, and you can touch, and you can eat from that tree of life, and you can receive wisdom, you can receive guidance, you can receive understanding of life, and you can be turned from that which is the hellion into that which is heavenly. And that one sacred, holy tree that has the fruit of life within and ready for you to take up, the church says, stay away, it's evil. Even the government doesn't tell you to stay away from it. There's only one group that's afraid of it, and that's the church. Stay away from it. Because once you find that, then you truly find life. See? <laughs> Hitler says, it's good that we cleanse the Jews out of our midst. And what happens? Everybody followed. Didn't make any difference. And don't tell me the churches didn't, because the churches over there did. Christian churches lined right up. There was not one Christian church over there that stood any ground and said, we shouldn't do this. They lined right up. They had their church services every Sunday, and they sang Amazing Grace, and I'll walk in the garden and praise God and praise Jesus Christ, and they lined right, right up behind this madman, and they said, did nothing about it because they were doing ethnic cleansing. They were getting rid of the Christ killers. And they supported it every step of the way. So we said, oh, we've got to go to Vietnam because we've got to cleanse, you know, we've got to cleanse all the communists out of Vietnam. So 50,000 Americans and hundreds of thousands of people they slaughtered. You don't even know where the place is now. What's the big deal? Did you ever think somebody should stop and say, let's study this. We lost. It became communist. So what? Now you're over there trying to sell stuff over there and sign trade agreements with the same people that if, if they won, the whole world was going to go down the toilet. Thousands of people killed. Thousands of people firebombed. Thousands of villages burned up. And people in churches saying, God is on our side. Amazing grace. Oh, God, send our boys back home. And for what? And nobody's ever, ever confronts it and says it's evil. In fact, the ones who ran away from the evil are called traitors. They're traitors. You know why? Because we demand, we demand, the government demands and the church demands that you bow your knee to the leader no matter what he says is right or wrong. You have to be loyal. You must be loyal to the evil. It doesn't make any difference. That's all that's required of you. You follow. You do as you're told. You don't question whether it's right or wrong. If they throw you a gun, you shoot it. And if you run away, you're considered a traitor. To what? <sighs> What's so important with what goes on in this place that you're sitting right now is I'm trying and I'm hoping that each one of you develops your inner person, chart your own course from that which is Christ consciousness, and stay away from the evil which is perpetuated by those outside for the sake of your children, for the sake of the culture, for the sake of the animals, for the sake of life itself, you become an individual and listen to the Christ who dwells within you and turn a deaf ear to the religions and the systems of the world. Because they are patently, grossly evil. And you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that. All you've got to do is sit down and turn on the television or open the newspaper and see it. And the and, and the churches and the politicians are in bed so deeply with all of these religious leaders. I mean, uh, you, you, you know, you can't help it. The, whether Billy Graham is going in to give advice to this president or that president or the other president, and they all spew the same thing. You know, we've got to have a strong military and we've got to be ready to do war. It's always war, war, war. And we've got to be able to put down the others. And those who have a philosophy of religion that's different than ours are our most patent enemies. Those who are the Muslims, what would you do if you're a Muslim? Who would you do? What would you think of Christianity? It was Christians who rode in with horses and swords and pictures of Jesus Christ on our banners that were slaughtering their women, that were slaughtering their men, and that were going to try to rape and pillage and destroy everything that they had until the Muslims raised their armies and drove them back to Rome where they belonged. So what would you think? Do you want them to come? you want to go to their churches? 
You want to listen about their God? All you can ever remember is seeing their God on a banner as they came charging on horses ready to slit your throat because you didn't believe the way they believed. And I'll tell you, that's not changed a whole lot today. But here we have people in our system, we have people in our government who are totally unconscious. They have never stimulated their consciousness. They therefore cannot make any decisions on their own, so they come to church, and if somebody says we are a cult, they say we are a cult. They've never been here, they've never listened, they've never understood, they've never even taken the time to think about it. Somebody said we are, we must be. See, this was the most dangerous thing in the world. If you listen to somebody else, and, and when that person says, that is the way it is, and you say, that's the way it is, because somebody said that's the way it is. Instead of being an individual, I'm not asking you to, to agree with me. I don't want you to agree with me. If you can say, I don't agree with that, that's good. That's what you're here to do, to disagree. To think for yourself, to chart your own course, to find the pathway that God has taken you to, because you're different than I am. What is particularly spiritual for me is not going to be what's particularly spiritual for you, because you're a different person. You're a unique person. You have a unique personality. I don't want you to be like me. I don't want you to be like other people here. You used to be unique and be that special you, and stand on your own feet and just follow that beacon within yourself. But what do we find? We find people who are constantly looking for external rules and regulations which can guide them. So if the rule maker picks evil, everybody picks up the banner and marches off to it. It doesn't make any difference. What do you do? Do you ever question? Do you ever go out anywhere and say, this is wrong? No. We say, well, that's the law. That's the rule. We got to do it. What can you do? You can't fight City Hall. But you can because you can make City Hall crumble with the power that is within you. And that's what Jesus Christ said about the churches. And they said, oh, Jesus, look at the beautiful churches. He said, there's not going to be one rock left standing on top of the other. They're worthless. And so then, when you follow that, which is patently, blatantly evil, you, 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 you finally say you call evil good, and good becomes evil. Those who are trying to find peace those who are trying to set a pathway for your children, for you, for your family, are considered evil. In Isaiah chapter 50, uh, 5, verse 20, it says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. But if you're not stimulating your consciousness, you're going to depend on those who are near you in your family. You're going to depend on those who are near you in your church. You're going to depend on those who are near you in government or business. And you'll never, ever be able to think for yourself. But 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, if you get into meditation, you have the mind of Christ. This is what you should want. This is what, this is, nothing should stand between you and the opportunity to come and to sit and to enter into that period of meditation and to purge away all of the thoughts and all of those things that have hurt you and enter into that blessedness of nirvana. And then you can discern good from evil. The, the mind that you had is not the mind that you held. It'll change. You follow the path of a different drummer. You're an individual mind. And you, don't, and you don't join the group. You don't follow the group. And that's the beautiful part of all this. There's something that Carl Jung said that I would share with you. Carl Jung says the problem is with education that, listen to what he said, teachers teach about the social consciousness, but never say anything about the secrets of the private experience. Okay. You never, how many of you have ever been in school? You've all gone to school, most of you, high school, college. How many ever <laughs> sat with a teacher who told you about that private experience which manifests itself into a direction for life, that experience that you can touch. Forget about it from a religious or spiritual standpoint, but understand it from a standpoint of just being a human being, that there is within you that modem that will be turned on and will direct your life as it directs the lives of, of the beasts of the field so that they can survive against the things that come upon them. The society and the church turn out people who are not capable of thinking for themselves. They're not capable of thinking for themselves. So what a few leaders decide is good or evil, that's it. That's not it. See, you've got to be a revolutionary. Jesus Christ got killed not because he was a religious guy. He wasn't. He got killed because he was a revolutionary. They said, you've got to follow this guy. He says, you follow him. 
And you can't just continue to go on and on. And now it doesn't make any difference because you could sit here and say, ah, I don't think so. It doesn't make any difference because you're going to be swept with the tide. When you get out into that ocean and you're bobbing up and down, when a big wave comes, it knocks you flat. It doesn't make any difference whether you're with it or not. Off you go, tumbling, you know what, over tea kettle. There you go, spinning right up the beach. It doesn't, doesn't care. And when this wave is moving through the universe, it'll consume everything and consumes everybody that gets in its way. And that's the beautiful thing. See? The person who wishes to have an answer for your, for your family has got to first understand yourself. Let me show you something. Page 847. We've done this scripture probably more than any other scripture that I've ever done, but it's an important one and one that you should look when Jesus was teaching people who were Bible teachers. What did he say? And would you listen to it? Would you look at it? Would you turn off the preachers and turn off the ministers and say, let me look at this, a Luke 11:52. woe unto you lawyers. You have taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in you hindered. Do you know that's exactly what they do today? The Bible teachers, the Bible pundits, the born-again, they will hinder anyone who tries to enter within themselves. They will do anything they can to stop people from entering in themselves. And there's a reason for it, because they're acting on their carnal instinct that says, when these people start entering in themselves, we've lost them. We've lost them. What happens to the, to the communistic, capitalistic organization that we've got here? What happens to the money? What happens to our power? It's gone because they've entered into themselves. And Jesus Christ says, you've taken away the key of knowledge because you haven't entered within yourself. And they'll do it. When you enter in yourself, you close in on the place where your instincts dwell, and you'll no longer be comfortable with wrong direction. <laughs> you know what you have to do? Here, I'll prove it to you. <coughs> Let me show you how uncomfortable you For those of you who have come to this place for a long time, go ahead and turn on Trinity Broadcasting and see how uncomfortable you are as soon as they start talking. You can't even deal with it. You cannot deal with it. And here you have a guy with his hair slicked, his wife sitting there, hi Rick Sala, oh hi Jack, and here they are. This is it, this is religious. Oh Jack, it's so great, they're stockpiling atomic weapons. Oh Jack, this is gonna be the greatest war. Oh I know Rick Sala, I'm excited Rick Sala, I'm excited. <laughs> He's excited, millions of people are gonna get killed. This is a big show, this guy's got millions of people on him. Oh Rick Sala. And Rex Sala can't wait to tell him how many who got killed in what country. Oh, they're dying all over the place. Oh, I know Rex Sala. He's just so excited. <laughs> what is this? And then here's people who are out getting slaughtered by drugs and bombs and wars and violence. And the TBN spends three, three hours talking about Ouija boards. Shall I go to this movie? You know what? What is important? What makes sense? But we get caught up in all of their barbaric superstition. But you know you can't look at it. I challenge you. If you come here and if you follow this thing that is within yourself, turn on Christian television, take a look at it for 10 minutes. And you say, my God, what are they talking about? It is absolutely bizarre. Bizarre. But see, the point is this. You have come very close to the Christ instinct. And when you come close to the Christ instinct, it has no place for violence. It has no place for that type of teaching. Christ instinct does not scare children. Christ instinct does not scare adults. Christ instinct does not put people in guilt. Christ instinct does not put people in fear. Christ instinct does not talk about dropping bombs on people, setting fire to people. Christ instinct does not talk about devils in a hell where you burn forever and people sticking you with pitchforks because you, you, you went to the Taj Mahal and <laughs> Donald Trump. Stop already with that nonsense. Jesus. But that's, let me, let me say, the, the, the Christian way of coming against evil gives you some idea we're up against. They bind evil in the name of Jesus. I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. The problem is the guy's name isn't Jesus. Now what do you do? <laughs> they got the wrong guy. His name isn't Jesus. If his name was Jesus, he'd be in Puerto Rico. His name is not Jesus. So why not use the right guy? His name is Yeshua. They wouldn't dare use his right name. Did you ever think of that? Even I don't use his right name. I feel uncomfortable. But we don't. We do not use, why don't we? Nobody has ever used the man's right name. So we got some other guy. Here's your God's in heaven. He said, he said to Jesus, I heard this because I was, I was he said, Jesus, he said, wait a minute, Jesse. He calls him Jesse for short. Jesse. 
Who is this guy, James? I don't know. Where did they get this from? I think he lives in Havana. I don't know what. <laughs> They're asking for this, and somebody, why didn't they talk in my name? I don't know. They picked this guy, Jesus. I mean, his name is Joshua. So they bind it in Jesus' name. They walk away, and the evil continues until they come back next week and bind it again. But the evil never stops. The violence never stops. Right? Do you know that as recently as the beginning of the 11th century, the belief rose that the devil and not God created the world? Do you know that's the, that's the truth? And do you know the reason was because Christians couldn't explain evil? They still can't. If God created it, why would it be such an evil place? It must have been the devil. They can't explain it. But yet, even though they say evil, they'll celebrate war as a blessing as long as their side won. You'll see them after any war. They'll bring the color guard from the rings right in the church and they'll march right up and they'll all sing God bless America and wave the flag. They never ask who got Anybody get hurt here? Hey, what the hell? Hey, we want that. What do we care? Say. So it's an evil, but let's celebrate it because we won. We used it to our advantage. Let me tell you something. The devil did not make atomic bombs. People did. The horrors of the world are the creation of people. And the reason is because of mob psychology. Religion has refused Jesus, refused Buddha, refused Krishna, and they have created a devil to blame for their failures. How could they exist if they didn't say, oh, there has to be a devil, or else you should have been able to solve the problem. So what do they do? Jeremiah says, the prophets prophesy falsely, the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so, and what will you do in the end? See, we have to destroy the war gods. We have made Jehovah to take away that which was the Muslims and, and that which was the Arabs. We take away their life. It's in your Bible. Do you know your Bible says, Jehovah says, go in and take all of their stuff and kill all of their men and, and kill all of their women, and you can have the virgins for yourself. That's the word of God to God's chosen people. We created Jehovah to take away that which was the Arabs, so the Arabs have created Allah to get it back. So the war gods have got to be killed. We've got to kill the war gods, Allah and Jah, and we've got to make the love god. Thousands and thousands of years we've been talking about peace. We have been creating war. And the greatest wars in the history of mankind have been fought in the name of peace. You know what happens? Let me show you a little equation. You any into this? If you take war energy, okay, and divide it into peace energy, it will equal paradise. If you take all of the energy and all of the money and all of the power that you put into war and put that same energy and money and power into peace, you will have paradise. It's that simple. But you know what you do? You know what I do? We have spent so much time fighting with ourselves that suddenly we can't take it anymore and it spills out, and I gotta pick a fight with somebody else. I gotta fight with you because I can't fight with myself anymore. I can't take it inside of myself anymore, so I'll pick a fight outside. Nobody's ever stopped to say, what is inside of me that's growling and roaring and rumbling? And so what do we do? We have our leaders, and the politician creates war without, and the minister creates war within. And we seem to love to have it that, and we never stop to question it. See, it's not that you are having wars develop around you on the outside. It is that there is peace missing on the inside. And once you replace that peace, that war inside, with peace, then there will be peace in the house. Then there will be peace in the neighborhood. Then there will be peace in the city. Then there will be peace in the country. And then there will be peace in the world. And you know something, it's a funny thing, but if you were raised, as we were raised and watched television, many people come out, I'm against war. Do you know they're probably the most dangerous people in the world? 
they will actually go to war to prevent war. Do you ever see them? Peace marchers are marching down Broadway. Boy, and they'll battle with cops and shoot and everything else. The most violent people in the world. So what we then come to is a practice of the pool of silence. We're not against violence. We're not against evil. We're not against war. Because to be against anything is to be at war with it. Huh? We're not against anything. Because to be against anything is to be at war with it. What do we do? We simply understand that it exists and we enter into the pool of silence more and more and more people until finally the pool is so large that it drowns all of that which is evil, all of that which is war. It exists, yes, we understand that. But our meditation is so concentrated and grows to such an extent that one day it will not exist. Amen. Thank you for sharing this time with us. Oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> it's all right. Got an ovation here. Uh, John will come on and tell you what we need. Let's stay with us because we have some.